Chapter 15 Helicopter Operations Introduction This chapter provides information to help the instructor guide the student through various helicopter operations. It includes operational and safety considerations for on the ground and in the air. Collision avoidance as discussed in this handbook's Chapter 1, Introduction to Flight Training, as well as in the Aviation Instructor's Handbook. The instructor must ensure the student develops the habit of looking for other air traffic at all times. If a student believes the instructor assumes all responsibility for scanning and collision avoidance procedures, he or she will not develop the habit of maintaining the constant vigilance essential to safety. Remember to establish scan areas and communication practices for keeping the aircraft cleared. Any observed tendency of a student to enter flight maneuvers without first making a careful check for other air traffic must be corrected immediately. From the first flight, the instructor must make the student aware that it is every pilot's responsibility to see and avoid other aircraft. Explain the blind areas in the helicopter being flown, as well as those in other aircraft. Develop in the student a habit of checking for other aircraft during his or her regular scan pattern. All radio and radar aids should be used to the fullest extent possible, but with the realization that they are only aids, and vigilance should not be relaxed. Radar traffic advisories are very helpful, but there is evidence that indicates some pilots become complacent when in the radar environment and relax their vigil. Also, no turn should ever be made without first looking in the direction of the turn to see that the airspace is clear of other traffic. In the vicinity of an airport, all possible aids should be used and looking for other aircraft should occupy more of the student's time. Landing and anti-collision lights should be turned on to make the helicopter more visible, especially in the vicinity of an airport. Flight instructors should guard against preoccupation during flight instruction to the exclusion of maintaining a constant vigilance for other traffic. Be particularly alert during the conduct of simulated instrument flight in which there is a tendency to look inside. Place special training emphasis on areas of concern in which improvements in pilot education, operating practices, procedures, and techniques are needed to reduce mid-air conflicts. Notify the control tower operator, at airports where a tower is manned, regarding student first solo flights. Explain the availability and encourage the use of expanded radar services for arriving and departing aircraft at terminal airports where this service is available, as well as the use of radar traffic advisory services for transiting terminal areas or flying between on route points. Understand and explain the limitations of radar that may frequently limit or prevent the issuance of radar advisories by air traffic controllers. Runway incursions stress upon the student that, even though helicopters do not regularly use runways for takeoffs and landings, runway incursions need to be understood and discussed. Students need to listen carefully to any clearances and instructions from air traffic control, ATC, and acknowledge them in full. They should also be aware of their position and the position of other aircraft and obstructions at all times. Figure 15-1. During flight training, instructors often use runways to practice maneuvers and procedures. Extra vigilance must be exercised under these circumstances as the instructor and student may become so focused on the particular maneuver or procedure that they become inattentive to the surroundings. Safety considerations Good manners are an essential part of helicopter operations. If a helicopter is not operated with consideration for nearby persons and property, it can be a nuisance or, even worse, a hazard. A considerate attitude must be cultivated by example and instruction from the beginning of training. Stress to the student that the helicopter's unique ability of landing and taking off near a crowd of people creates downwash that can stir up debris and blow it at high velocity for a considerable distance, causing possible injury to people and damage to property. Remind the student of the potential hazard of someone on the ground walking into turning rotors. Figure 15-2, the tail rotor, in particular, is hard to notice. Therefore, it is mandatory that a student understand the potential hazards to others created by a helicopter and the pilot's responsibility to prevent them. The rotor tip path plane is not always easy to see, and it may be difficult to judge its distance from fixed objects. A beginning student should be encouraged to maintain more than adequate clearance from all objects and to be constantly aware of both main and tail rotor paths. The instructor should review with the student the pilot handbook and discuss the danger areas of the main and tail rotor clearance distances. Review Figure 1-5 with student. Traffic patterns The student must be able to describe the traffic patterns used by both helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft naming the legs and specifying pattern altitudes. The student must also demonstrate the ability to fly traffic patterns at uncontrolled fields while avoiding the flow of fixed-wing traffic and complying with tower instructions at controlled airports. Figure 15-3 Instructional points, the student should learn the correct procedures for fixed-wing aircraft at controlled and uncontrolled airports. This knowledge provides the student with an understanding of where to expect fixed-wing aircraft, and how to avoid them in the traffic pattern. 
Teach the student how to search the airport facility guide to check for the fixed wing traffic pattern in order to be able to avoid the flow of traffic. Instructors should also reference the helicopter flying handbook, which details fixed wing traffic patterns and how helicopters can avoid the traffic and learn how to operate in it in the event the tower has mixed traffic. Advise the student to pay attention to any wind indicators, such as wind socks, flags, and smoke. Typically, traffic patterns in a helicopter are flown lower and closer than those flown by fixed wing aircraft. The typical traffic pattern altitude is 500 to 800 feet above ground level, AGL, for helicopters, while for most fixed wing aircraft it is 1,000 to 1,500 feet AGL. Note, always refer to the airport facility guide for traffic pattern altitudes as some airports use different altitudes. By regulation, turbine-powered airplanes should use 1,500 feet for the downwind leg. For training purposes, a rectangular course should be flown because there is better visibility, the aircraft has a level portion in each leg that facilitates clearing of traffic. A rectangular course also allows the pilot to estimate winds from the amount of crab necessary to offset the wind drift and provides a repeatable profile point to begin the approach. It helps the student to practice good aircraft control profile usable in many other maneuvers. Common student difficulties drift correction The student might fail to notice the effect of wind, especially on the downwind and base legs, resulting in a distorted pattern. If this problem persists, it may be necessary to review and practice ground reference and tracking maneuvers. Spacing from other aircraft It is difficult for beginning students to estimate distances from other aircraft, to estimate the space required to avoid interference, and to decide whether their own aircraft and another are on a collision course. Point out that with converging aircraft, if the other aircraft's relative position is not changing, then both aircraft are on a collision course. In this case, the quickest way to change relative position is to turn toward the other aircraft's tail. When two aircraft are approaching head-on, each pilot should alter course to the right. Review with the student Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, 14 CFR, Part 91, Section 91.113, Right-of-Way Rules, Except Water Operations. Altitude and airspeed Maintaining a constant altitude and airspeed can be very difficult for the beginning student. Problems can stem from lack of scanning, chasing the instruments or not flying the horizon, and not being able to recognize changes in engine and rotor sounds. Students should be encouraged to use all of their senses to help focus on the entire aircraft and not just one or two instruments at a time. Student trouble with fluctuating airspeeds is often caused by a hand and arm relaxing on the cyclic. Demonstrate how the arm at the cyclic slips slowly back when the pilot is fatigued or overly relaxed, which brings the cyclic back, causing the airspeed to fluctuate and altitude to increase. If the student is not tall enough to rest the elbow on a leg while flying, the arm can tire as the student must hold it up the entire time. Watch the student's arm position throughout the flight. If this does become a problem, place a large sponge or rolled up shirt between the arm and leg to help with the fatigue, which also helps to maintain altitude and airspeed. Failure to scan can also be the cause of altitude and airspeed deviations. Fixating on instruments or the intended landing area can be fixed by reminding the student to keep scanning and to focus on more than just one aspect of the flight. Airspace The helicopter instructor should integrate knowledge of the classifications of airspace throughout the training process from pre-flight planning to actual flight. Ensure the student understands helicopter regulatory requirements for operations in the various types of airspace based on type of pilot certificate held. Provide a thorough discussion of airspace particularly as it is relevant to helicopters. Instruction should include as a minimum. Endorsement requirement for student pilots, equipment requirements, communication requirements, whether minimums discuss the pilot's responsibility regarding operations in all airspace and over all types of terrain. Figure 15 for, for example, operations and procedures in Class B airspace differ from operations in Class G airspace, and operations in mountainous terrain differ from operations conducted over open water. Tie in pre-flight planning, aeronautical decision-making, ADM, risk management, and other topics as they relate to airspace and type of operations. Discuss the ATC system and the services it provides. Refer the student to the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, 14 CFR, and the Aeronautical Information Manual, AIM, for additional information. Helicopter Turbine and Multi-Engine Transition When transitioning a student into either a turbine or multi-engine helicopter, the instructor should carefully plan the course of instruction to fully encompass the procedures contained in the Rotorcraft Flight Manual, RFM, for the helicopter being used. Ensure the student pilot has the opportunity to fly the helicopter at maximum gross weights to learn the characteristics and different aircraft responses when the helicopter is fully loaded. Emergency training should never be conducted while carrying passengers. The student pilot should fully understand the significance of the helicopter-specific airspeeds, 
such as the takeoff safety speed for Category A rotorcraft, FOS, and Category A versus Category B helicopter operations and limitations, power plant limitations, and possibly transmission limitations for the helicopter being flown. Instrumentation and navigation displays must be understood before flight, as well as the operation of controls such as engine condition levers, governors, and stability augmentation systems. If a multi engine helicopter requires backing up and climbing some for a category of takeoff profile, the instructor should ensure that some reasonable and practical procedure is taught and practiced to maintain tail rotor and tail boom obstruction clearance during the maneuver, as discussed in 14 CFR Part 25, Sections 23.53 through 23.61. In any event, the instructor must ensure that the student gains a thorough understanding of the differences between Category A and Category B operations. Additionally, if the helicopter is usually flown with a crew of two, then crew resource management should be explained and practiced. Terminology, checklist procedures, crew coordination, flight briefing, and crew position duties and responsibilities should be presented and practiced in detail. If the student is transitioning to a turbine engine helicopter, the instructor should review the differences in the power plant response to load changes and power demands, the importance of proper starting procedures, monitoring, limitations, failure modes, and consequences of poor procedures and inattention. When a student transitions into a turbine or multi-engine helicopter, this usually includes their first introduction to power checks, also called health indicator, HIT checks, engine monitoring, etc. Power checks allow the pilot to determine if the engine or engines is slash are producing rated power before takeoff. Usually, power checks are a function of some type of maintenance program to extend the service time of the power plant. Turbine engines are very expensive, so any method to safely extend the service time of the power plant is welcome. If the power check values are not within limits or change from one day to the next by a large margin, the pilot should write up the check as a discrepancy and bring it to the attention of maintenance. It is always cheaper to fix a problem before it becomes an airborne emergency. Turbine engines can have a failure mode of disintegrating and sending out parts at high enough speeds to penetrate the other engine, fuel lines, driveline components, and compartments. A poor power check value can be an indication of a worn engine or one that may be ready to fail. The student should be thoroughly trained to observe temperature and torque limitations. Additionally, the student should be trained how to determine which limitation is for that time and place, as well as why. Floats, wheeled landing gear, or ski transitions when transitioning a student to a helicopter equipped with floats, wheeled landing gear, or skis, the instructor should carefully plan the course of instruction to fully encompass. The procedures contained in the Rotorcraft Flight Manual, RFM, for the helicopter being used. Floats fixed inflated type floats must be checked daily for inflation and may limit the airspeeds and maneuvering capability of the helicopter. Water landings can be uneventful or very demanding, depending on the winds and waves. Auto rotations to the water can be very challenging if the water is smooth and calm. Rotor wash disturbs the water surface, which can make hovering over a position most difficult. Should the pilot need to shut down on floats and then restart, uncontrolled turning should be expected until sufficient RPM is gained to allow heading control with the pedals. A pilot flying over the water should be taught to carefully observe the water's surface for wind direction and swell parameters. Due to the lack of reference points, navigation over large bodies of water is somewhat different than land navigation. For example, the wind direction does not usually vary as much over land due to the lack of surface friction, but thunderstorms tend to form more at night over larger bodies of water, which makes the occurrence of fog more likely. Haze can also be dense enough to restrict visibility to 3 miles. Many helicopters sit somewhat low in the water on fixed floats, so tail rotor clearance can be a hazard in very small waves. Landing close to boats or ships exposes the helicopter to ropes, lines and cranes on the larger vessels. All of these can constitute deadly hazards to a helicopter and should be discussed in detail. Work on floats involves flight over water so the crew and passengers must have life jackets. The pilot must ensure the passengers are equipped with life jackets and briefed on how the equipment works and what the best course of action is in the event they are required to land in water. Discuss with the student that water operations are much more demanding on the maintenance crews because of corrosion control, to include engine washes are major items. In most operations near salt water, the pilot performs a daily engine wash, while the maintenance crew performs more extensive washes periodically. Wheeled landing gear Wheeled landing gear must be inflated properly to prevent ground resonance. If the wheels are retractable, the pilot must follow a checklist to ensure gear extension before landing. Usually, if the gear retracts, there are emergency landing gear extension procedures for the student to learn. There may be maximum air speeds for landing gear operation, retraction, and extension. Skis skis, or snow pads, 
settle into the snow over time and become almost glued to the surface. Skis also slip under tree limbs and other obstructions very easily. Always ensure the skis or snow pads are free of the surface before lifting all of the way to a hover. Snow operations include other hazards, such as whiteouts and loss of the horizon, as the snow blends into a white sky. Snow can hide depressions and in itself be unstable if near a high area. Always maintain flight RPM until you are certain that the snowy surface fully supports the helicopter and is stable under the added weight of the helicopter. External Loads 14 CFR Part 133 and Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, Advisory Circular, AC, 133-1 to provide information for rotorcraft external load operations. No person subject to this part may conduct rotorcraft external load operations within the United States without a rotorcraft external load operator certificate issued by the FAA in accordance with 14 CFR Part 133, Section 133.17. Additionally, the pilot must have the exclusive use of at least one rotorcraft that, 1. was type certificated under and meets the requirements of 14 CFR Part 27 or 29, but not necessarily with external load carrying attaching means installed, or of 14 CFR Part 21, Section 21.25, for the special purpose of rotorcraft external load operations, 2. complies with the certification provisions in 14 CFR Part 133, Subpart D that apply to the rotorcraft load combinations for which authorization is requested. 3. Has a valid standard or restricted category airworthiness certificate. For the purposes of this section, a person has exclusive use of a rotorcraft if he or she has the sole possession, control, and use of it for flight as owner, or has a written agreement, including arrangements for the performance of required maintenance, giving him or her that possession, control, and use for at least six consecutive months. Personnel the pilot must hold a current commercial or airline transport pilot certificate issued by the FAA, with a rating appropriate for the rotorcraft as prescribed in 14 CFR Part 133, Section 133.19. One pilot, who may be the applicant, must be designated as chief pilot for rotorcraft external load operations. The applicant also may designate qualified pilots as assistant chief pilots to perform the functions of the chief pilot when the chief pilot is not readily available. The chief pilot and assistant chief pilots must be acceptable to the FAA and each must hold a current commercial or airline transport pilot certificate, with a rating appropriate for the rotorcraft as prescribed in 14 CFR section 133.19. The holder of a rotorcraft external load operator certificate must report any change in designation of chief pilot or assistant chief pilot immediately to the FAA certificate holding office. The new chief pilot must be designated and must comply with 14 CFR section 133.23, within 30 days or the operator may not conduct further operations under the Rotorcraft External Load Operator Certificate unless otherwise authorized by the FAA Certificate Holding Office. Knowledge and skill the applicant, or the chief pilot designated in accordance with 14 CFR Part 133, section 133.21b, must demonstrate to the FAA satisfactory knowledge and skill regarding rotorcraft external load operations. The test of knowledge, which may be oral or written, at the option of the applicant, covers the following subjects. 1. Steps to be taken before starting operations, including a survey of the flight area. 2. Proper method of loading, rigging, or attaching the external load. 3. Performance capabilities, under approved operating procedures and limitations, of the rotorcraft to be used. 4. Proper instructions of flight crew and ground workers. 5. Appropriate rotorcraft load combination flight manual. The test of skill requires appropriate maneuvers for each class requested. The appropriate maneuvers for each load class must be demonstrated in the rotorcraft as prescribed in 14 CFR Part 133, Section 133.19. These include 1. Takeoffs and landings. 2. Demonstration of directional control while hovering. 3. Acceleration from a hover. 4. Flight at operational airspeeds. 5. Approaches to landing or working area. 6. Maneuvering the external load into the release position. 7. Demonstration of winch operation, if a winch is installed to hoist the external load. Before attempting external loads, the student must be familiar with helicopter performance and the procedures outlined in the RFM. Ensure the student is aware that pre-flight planning is not complete until the ground crew is briefed on essential safety criteria, such as signals and emergency procedures. Discuss load pickup, on route, and load release procedures and the fact that operations need to be at an altitude that ensures the load clears all obstacles. When possible, 
Plan the route of flight through an area that is not densely populated. Emphasize the differences in helicopter handling characteristics for external loads and internal loads. Emergency procedures instruct the student in emergency load release procedures and point out that unnecessary overflight of populated areas should be avoided. Ensure the student is aware that, during pickup and normal release of a load, the helicopter is usually operating in the danger area of the height velocity diagram. Depending on the operation and configuration, great care should be exercised to isolate the external load release from the radio or intercom transmit button to prevent inadvertent load release. If at all possible, the student should exercise the emergency or manual load release system during flight to build the habit pattern. If the helicopter does not have dual or mutually accessible emergency cargo release controls, the instructor should develop a procedure and brief the student on the emergency actions to be accomplished by each crew member in the case of an actual emergency. Some version of cargo hook arming and safing procedures should be practiced. Instructor tips, remind the student that all aircraft have blind spots whether they are in the air or on the ground, and pilots must maintain a continuous scan to keep the helicopter clear. During external load training, remind the student that not only the helicopter needs to clear an obstacle on takeoff, sufficient altitude must also be attained in order for the load to clear the obstacle. Stay close to the controls at all times and always be ready to take control of the aircraft. Be prepared for both the expected and the unexpected. Chapter Summary This chapter presented some training techniques and instructional points that can be used to familiarize the student with helicopter operations in and around airports. It also briefly discussed transition of students into turbine and multi-engine helicopters, as well as points to emphasize during external load training.